Well, <clears throat> let's pray. We are thankful, Father, that you sit upon the throne and you do all things well, even when we don't understand it, Lord. May our hearts, no matter what happens to us and where it leads, the road leads, we would look up and thank you that you guide all things. Because chaos and not knowing what happens and things seem to be random and not orderly. It's so easy to become self-centered and think the world revolves around our problem. Oh, that we would mature to the, to the extent that we look to our Heavenly Father when we're in the furnace, we're in the fire, that you might be pleased to mold us into the kind of saint that would honor the living God. I don't know what battles my brothers are having this day, God, but we would ask that each one of them would trust you and as we start the genesis of our study in the Psalms, may these Psalms so speak as they have down through the centuries so that we might be lifted up to the throne of grace. And finally, Lord, would you be with us as week after week, if you'd be pleased, and that we would worship you as we would look at the Psalms, how, uh, what a tragedy it would be, God, if, if we would study the Psalms and we would not worship you. And so through this introduction, may we prepare our hearts each week as we come to be fed by you and to worship the King. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we want to look at an introduction to the book, to the books of the Psalms. And um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through everything in my notes because you think uh, I'm crazy. But this is the introduction that I give to uh, my students when I teach the Psalms. And what you need to do is become familiar with these uh, notes and look at them because I will refer back to them on a numerous occasions as we're going through a Psalms and I'll say something like, well, you know, this is a figure of speech that I put in your introduction psalm. It's a figure of speech of this so that you might be able to have that together or I'll make some other comment that will go back when we especially... Uh, get to an imprecatory section of a psalm. You say, what, no, what, no, what? Well, we'll, we'll understand what the, the imprecatory psalms are when we come to them. Now, you're going to think I'm crazy as uh, we begin this introduction of the psalms to turn to the book of Romans, <laughs> chapter 12. I know we just finished the book of Romans, but I want to look at a passage by way of introduction in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> because if we are going to study the Psalms, if you're going to study anything in the Scripture, it should not be just a mere intellectual endeavor, correct? Ultimately, if you are studying the Scriptures correctly, Every day that you do that, it should lead you to a devotion and worship of God. And one of the things that the Psalms is uh, very helpful to do is that very thing. To lift us from the noise and the clamor of this world and cause us to look 
to the heavenly Father, and in the midst of it, to bow the knee in worship of him. And notice that Romans chapter 12, verse 1, in that great transition in that book, uh, from the more doctrinal section to the practical section, he says, I urge you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. Now, isn't that worship? Isn't that an Old Testament concept brought now into a New Testament situation that we are to give not just the old sacrifices, the literal sacrifices, but our bodies are a burnt offering, because that's what he's looking at. He's looking at the burnt offering for which God got it all. You put the, the uh, sacrifice on the altar, and you didn't get anything. The priest didn't get anything. God got it all, because it, he was, uh, by the burnt offering, you are saying you are dedicating your life to God. And if it was the high priest representing Israel, he was representing that the entire nation is God's because we place it on the altar. And as we often said when we went through this passage of Scripture in Romans, that the problem with a living sacrifice is that we call off the altar. A dead one, you don't have to worry about that. So we have to constantly check whether we are on the altar all of our life, all that we possess, all of our dreams and hopes and ambitions, are they on the altar? And notice the conclusion, and that's what I want to get to, which is your spiritual service of worship. All of life should be worshiped. All of my dedication to God. I get up in the morning, Lord, this is your day. Because I want to worship. My service, my work should be my service of worship. So you're going to your worship today <laughs> at work. And so my question then is, what is worship? Psalms leads us to worship. It leads us to God. But I have found over the years, people, or at least for me too, before I studied it many years ago, I didn't know what worship was. I found out that I did on occasion worship, but... It, when I found the definition of it, I was more um, uh, confirmed to that that's what I was going to do. And if Romans is correct, my entire life should be a spiritual service of worship. My whole life should be worship. Whatever I do is worship. Have you ever thought about when you go to work, how is it that I might be able to have a service of worship? It will change your work life. That should be also said in our playtime, <laughs> in our leisure time, in our hobby times, any time. How can that be a service of worship to God? And then what is worship? And I would like to go through my definition. It'll be very uh, long and drawn out, but I hope to also to, um, uh, what shall I say, to uh, shorten it after I get a long one. First of all, worship is an act. It's more than an act. It's more than just something that you do. It is an attitude, and I'm going to get to that. But ultimately, the attitude has to be put into shoe leather into some kind of action by a redeemed man or woman. Now, um, I want you to know 
Everybody worships something. But they don't necessarily worship the true God. Even if you're an atheist, you're worshiping something. You're dedicated to something. And only a redeemed man can truly worship. He may not worship even if he is redeemed. But the only way we have connections in true worship to God is that we're born again, that we are redeemed. And then I said um, uh, uh, a redeemed man, the creature toward the creator. Now, the reason why I say that is in uh, uh, apologetics, it is a very important to make a creature creation distinction because if you don't, you get into thinking that everything's God. And that, of course, false, right? Everything God has made, but every, everything is not God. God is in the sense um, omnipresent, in present in everything, in the sense that he's here, but he's not in the, he's, you can't grab the chair and say, now I got God. Are you with me? He fills all of space and time. And uh, so there is a creator. I, if he is my creator, then as a creature, I need to worship the creator. And this is where we get from the act to the mental aspects of it because it should involve both the will, in intellect, and the emotions. You have not truly and fully worshipped God unless all three are involved. Some churches are really into the emotional part. Some churches are mostly or often in only the intellectual part. Now I agree, the intellectual should take the lead in things. You can feel like you're worshiping and your emotions are really going this, that, and the other, but you have no idea what you're thinking. You just along with the beat and love the music and this, that, and the other, and you're singing this phrase over and over, and you're not concentrating on it, and you're just being involved in emotion. Here at Bethel, I don't think we have a problem with getting too much into emotion, okay? But there are churches that do, and that can just completely be overtaken in emotion. But our intellect should be the lead by which uh, my uh, will and my emotions uh, Enter in to full worship. Uh, some people are a demonstrative in their worship. I have a tendency to, to speak out a little bit around the church. So if you're around me, I'm saying amen and yes, Lord. That just comes out. I don't even have to live. I hear a phrase that that touches my emotions, and I say, yes, Lord, amen, as I'm singing. Because I want to, I hope I'm not bothering other people too bad, but I, because I, I don't want to ruin their worship, but I want to enter in fully into what is called worship. And it is all three. You don't fully engage into worship unless all three. And of course it has to be done, if we are, are correct, in the, the uh, atmosphere of what church you're in so that you're doing everything decently and in order. Doing something at one church emotionally and coming here and doing it in this church may not be in the culture and climate of what it is and therefore you would be out of order. And we would cause people not to worship. I don't want to do that. Are you with me? So we have to be sensitive to the culture of a church wherever you go. So that when I enter into the three aspects of, of, of worship, the intellect, the emotion, and the will, that I am in that culture of that church, that I am doing okay. I am not out of order. Because Paul says we ought to do everything decently and in order. 
and that is in some ways culturally within a church. And you know what? Just because someone's more demonstrative in their emotions does not necessarily mean they're worshiping any more than the one that is silent and yet their hearts aflamed with motion emotion that is toward God my question to you is this how's your worship do, do have you ever thought about uh, how I am worshiping. Does your, does, are you entering in fully into worship? Or are you just singing the words? I mean, I used to, I, I had people before I taught on this and some of the churches that I was a pastor is they had no idea about worship. They were waiting, to say, man, I wish they'd get rid of these songs so I can get into the word. I want to hear the preacher preach the word. And they were missing completely the concept of corporate worship. How you individually worship will help you in your corporate worship. Now, you, in individual worship, you can, you can get, I guess, unless your neighbors complain, you can get as loud as you want. Right? And my wife and I do that, I, I, but we're so thankful for the internet. Man, we got songs and we were singing last yesterday, last night. Man, we were just singing along, just shouting to the Lord and in, uh, in, in, uh, in singing great hymns of, uh, of the faith and songs of the faith and the phone ring. You know, and here it's blasting, you know, and I said, well, I got to get the phone. And I got the phone, music's going all the way. It was my granddaughter. And I said, what? She, she says, well, what are you doing, Papa? I said, we are got the music going, Ashlyn, and we are just singing to the top of our lungs, and we are worshiping God. She says, well, am I bothering you? Can't, we want you to talk. I said, no, no, baby. She said, I'll talk to her whenever I can. <laughs> I said, we'll just turn it off. We can get it on later. Worshiping God in doing that. Had some people over the other night, and we didn't sing. We could have, but we, I believe we were worshiping God and sharing our hearts with one another. So, are you entering in fully into worship? You ought to ask yourself that. So, worship is an act by a redeemed man of the creature toward the creator whereby the will and intellect and emotion remember the intellect should be the lead it is through the intellectual understanding of the words being sing and the doctrines of the word that should emo cause the emotions to come forth and if it does then it's valid emotion as long as it's decent and in order but if you're just being emotion and enjoying the beat of the music and this, that, and the other, and that's what comes with the emotion. That's not valid. That's not true worship in that sense. Everybody okay? Well, in doing that, we should gratefully respond in reverential fear. Now, sometimes we don't like that word fear, but you can't read the Old Testament even into the, the New Testament, it says that we are to work out our salvation in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. He worked it in, right? We are to work it out in fear and trembling. So it's not just an Old Testament concept. It's a New Testament concept. Wish I had time to spend on the fear of God, but we'll never get through the introduction <laughs> if we do that. Where we humbly submit to God by means of spiritual offerings. Now, you say to me, what are spiritual offerings? Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2, it talks about that we are priests, right? Spiritual priests. And we are to offer uh, uh, um a spiritual offerings to God. So turn over to Brother Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse 
verse 5. You are living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. So he's using figures of speech uh, that we are stones in the church, in the living house. We're being built up in the, uh, 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 um, a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are a priest, not Old Testament priest. Concept we can understand, we can learn from the Old Testament, but we are now spiritual priests. And we are to be involved in offering up spiritual sacrifices. And you say to me, what are those spiritual sacrifices? Because that's part of your worship, right? So let's um, look here for a second. I happen to say, well, they're going to ask me what they are, so I better uh, have them ready. So I did. We'll get back to the definition in a second. <laughs> what, what is the deal here? Oh, sorry. The spiritual sacrifices. Now, I can't go through them, but I'm going to name them. The sacrifice of self, we already see, we have seen that in Romans chapter 12, right? The Lordship of Christ. The sacrifice of giving. Paul will talk about. The, the sacrifice for which somebody, some church gave uh, as a sweet aroma unto the Lord. Uh, so giving should be part of that, uh, should be part of worship. The sacrifice of worship, that's what uh, um, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 will say, as well as verse 16 talks about ministry, that we're involved in ministry. That's a sacrifice that we're supposed to be involved with. And it also in verse 16 of Hebrews 13, our fellowship with one another. And then it talks about our evangelism. Paul talks about that as a sacrifice. And he talks about discipleship being a sacrifice. And these are the seven sacrifices that I have found in the New Testament where the, the author's specifically Paul, except for a few, takes an Old Testament sacrificial language and makes it into a spiritual understanding. So I, as a spiritual priest, should be involved in these things. And you see those pink uh, ones there, those five principles? Those are the five principles that I and others have found, which are the basics for which every church must do if it's to do the principles of the New Testament in a church. And you as a priest should be involved in those every time you meet together and go somewhere. Yes. No, it's not in there. I put it in there last night. <laughs> Sorry. Can you give us a more practical example of each of these? Yeah, um, the practical example of, of Romans 12, 1 is, have you done that? Go read, uh, we just read 12, 1, and say, Lord, here I am, my life is yours, all my ambitions, my goals, whatever I want, are yours. I, I, it's your choice. If you haven't done that, you, haven't even took in, have, you have not taken the first step in introduction into being a correct spiritual priest. But guess what? You've got to check that. In 1970, I came to the, uh, to the understanding of that by God's grace. I hope I've grown since 1970. Well, my 100% at 1970 would not be what? Would not be 100% today unless I, because I hope I've grown some, so my understanding has grown, so therefore my commitment should have grown, correct? So I've constantly, yeah, it, it's kind of like saying I do when I got married. I do, but I found out what I do means a little more as I continued in my marriage. So my, my uh, commitment had to mature. The aspect, uh, how do you know what you value the most? 
out of the heart the mouth speaks, but also where your treasure is, so is your heart. So you give me your uh, calendar of what you do every day and, and your checkbooks and what you do with your money, and, and you, could say a, you can learn a great deal about what a person's worshiping. So it's an indicator. Well, I hope you understand what worship is, because we're giving a definition of that, so I'll stop with that one. Of ministry, anything that we would minister. Just think about when you come to church, when you come to church, you are a spiritual priest, and you ought to have these things in mind, and what you should be praying, which I do every time I come here, I say, okay, God, it's Sunday, the ch church is meeting together. Which, which sacrifice do you want me to do today? Which one? I want to worship, but how, oh, I'm supposed to minister to this person. So after when, when, the, when the church is over, I, I, man, that's, when my, that's your time. When, when you, if you come to, uh, to uh, the Sunday school in, in between, that's your time to minister. That's the time to be a spiritual priest. Just think what would happen to a church if everybody understood this and said, these are the things I need to do, and God, through the Holy Spirit, this day, wherever I am, especially when we meet together, I ought to be doing these. Which one should I do today, Lord? With what person? And I'm praying as I'm walking through this place of the building of your church building, saying, okay, who am I supposed to worship to? Who, who am I supposed to minister to? Who am I supposed to be involved with spiritual sacrifices today? It'll change the exact why you come to church. Most people come to church and sit down and get the bulletin and go, what are they going to do for me today? Well, I, I, I hope you get something. But we ought to sit down and say, what, what, what kind of worship do I, how, how am I going to be involved as a spiritual priest? Okay, so let's, and so therefore evangelism, discipleship, you can be all those kinds of things. That's what I mean by spiritual uh, uh, sacrifices. Okay. Think about it. You are a spiritual priest, and it could be that today, you're, it's the first time you have understood at least in some comprehensive way what I'm supposed to do as a priest. That's not good, but at least it's good that you know now. Right? You know what I do? I, I do this all the time at school. And I say to the students, you're a spiritual priest. Yeah, that's what it says, you're a prof. I say, well, what sacrifice have you been bringing forth? They go, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know too many people who know this. Now, when I tell them, they go, oh, yeah, I do some of that. I say, but how much more now you will be able to be a better priest when you know your responsibility through the power of the Spirit, right? All right. Back to our definition. You say, are you going to get through with these notes? I'm not going to go through all those, right, all at once. All right. So, we are, worship is an act of, by a redeemed man of the creature toward the creator, whereby his will and intellect and emotion gratefully respond in reverential fear and humble submission by means of a spiritual offerings and sacrifices to glorify the person and work and presence of God. So, notice again the concentration. I, I want to... How much different would it be when you met together or when you worship that you would have a sense that God is present? You know that that's true by his omnipresence. But somehow you would sense that. I'm not just going into the auditorium. I'm not just doing this or whatever. God is here. I sense his presence. How much easier it is to worship if you sense his presence. 
That means I have to take time to think it through. That we might glorify the person, the work, and the presence of God. Which is supremely demonstrated in Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit illumines God's written word to man's heart. That's my definition. I don't know if that's the best definition, but that's my definition. Um, I'll give you a brief definition in just a moment. But I want to drive this home by reading something that over the years has caused me to bring myself back to the practical aspect of worship. I used to take an old subscription to a magazine, a little thing, called Revival, The Need of the Times. And it had in it many practical aspects that would cause me to worship. It's now no longer in existence than they, its heart cry, which they still have some good things in it. But well, there was an article in there, and the title of it was, Where Are the Tears? Now, don't, don't discount that as emotionalism at the moment, okay? Hear me out. In the midst of it all, where is the tears? Where is the burden of the Lord? Where is the burning heart which the two on the Emmaus road had with the risen Christ? When the Salvation Army was having a tough time in a particular area in England in the 1800s, an officer of the Salvation Army sent a word to William Booth, the founder and president, and asked for advice. And Booth replied, with two words to this difficult area where not many people came to faith. Two words. He said, try tears. Would to God that the church leaders and believers in America today would heed Booth's advice. It is that phenomena which is upon the heart possibly because we find it so lacking and so rare in our own life and within the circles in which we live and worship. Where are the tears and where have they gone? Hmm. Ezra and the people wept bitterly. Whoop, I, I, I got a wrong one there. I would put it this way. When was the last time anyone has seen a congregation which holds to the evangelical biblical doctrines melt to tears while worshiping and weeping together in prayer, being moved to tears because of the glory of God, the work of Christ, and because of the lost condition of sinners? I've been in such circles for a number of years, but I have seen very few such times. Ironically, those who do weep are usually viewed by Christian leaders as being immature and weak and imbalanced or troubled. Hopefully they will cool down and get over it. Other, our heart's prayer should be that God would raise up a new breed of mature men and women and young people and whole churches who do not get over it. Times are dry. 
because our eyes are dry. Let's not sin further by blaming our condition upon such things as the sovereignty of God has not he said but to this man will I look even to him who is poor and contrite of spirit and trembles at my word in the evangelical and reformed circles there has been subtle differences but divorce between mental assent and the affections of the heart we can speak coldly and casually about the high doctrines of the Word of God. We can preach sound and truth with harshness and judgmental spirits. And the whole time our hearts, emotions, and affections remain calloused. We're not talking or speaking about emotionalism. But of the heart's emotions and affections being affected by the truth and the Spirit of God. The former, emotionalism, is false and dangerous. The latter is necessary and part of the biblical experience of Christianity. Church prayer meetings are held week after week, and prayers are prayed, but the spirit and heart are moved very little. Any sign of emotions or passion is often suspect and frowned upon. There is nothing more than a reactionary position to a false and shallow practice, a wrong reaction which springs from fear or bondage. We well remember in, in past years regularly being in Leonard Raven Hills, weekly prayer meetings in East Texas, which would usually last for two to three hours. The whole group would be brokenhearted in prayer, moved with the true burden in their hearts for the glory of God and for the wicked condition of the nation and the world. Time seemed to stand still in those prayer meetings. Eternity became very real. There were tears in those days. And where have they gone? Apparently, religious maturity has set in along with it spiritual rigor mortis. Ezra and the people wept bitterly during the Reformation in their days. Jeremiah wept. John the Apostle wept in the island of Patmos. Peter went out and wept bitterly. There is a place for it in our day for sure. We do not think there is much danger of becoming imbalanced in the matter. We could weep for a month straight and would still not balance out the extended period of dryness and dullness. It would do, it would do the church heavenly good to return to the old paths and try some tears. We might then get more done in a month than in a year. Why not tears? After all, no other substitute has worked. The church has tried everything else. When finally, when we finally become serious, and desperate enough, perhaps then we might hear William Booth say to us as well, try tears. The church's eyes are far too clouded with success and earthly mindedness and are far too dry. The late Keith Green said it well in the Lyrics of a song. My eyes are dry and my faith is old. My heart is hard and my prayers are cold. And I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. So what can I do with an old heart like mine? 
soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Come wash me anew with the wine of your blood. If we could set before us the greatest example of all, we would return to that of our Lord Jesus himself. Do we desire to be like Him in character, in conduct, in the holiness of life? Do we desire to be like Him in His habits and outlook and in practice? As we look, we can just see such a picture. A weeping man who was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. Let us look again very closely, such as in John 11, verse 35, at Lazarus' funeral, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Or what about Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, which really hit me. Listen to what it says. Who in the days of his flesh when he had uh, offered up prayers and supplications with strong cryings and tears unto him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. In the light of our Savior's life and example, in light of our lives, the condition of the church, in the deterioration of the condition of our nation and our world, we should answer the question, where are the tears? Let's pray. Come, Lord, we need you. Our, our country is falling apart. Our city is going their own way. The churches are weak. We as believers, oh God, how we need you. And the phrase why tears has a tendency to think about just the emotion of people being broken up. But it's part of a phrase that enters into the emotions of not just intellectual praying and dependence upon God. It has to come from you. It can't be just try to produce. But our hearts need to be affected, God. We need to come in true worship to the living God. And part of that is our emotions, led by the intellect of your word. Come, Lord, would you, among the men here, may our hearts be turned in true worship and adoration and love and devotion to the greatness and glory of our Savior. Come, Lord, help us as we would study the Psalms that we would worship you truly in Christ's name.